Well, we are going to dive into our Christmas series. Um, it, we are just excited for this month. We're excited for all that it represents. I love the story of Christmas. I love the Christmas season in general. It is an exciting time of year. And it isn't because of the magic of the season, because truthfully, the reality of this season is far greater than any magic ever could make it. It isn't about the magic of the Christmas season that makes it so special. You know, Christmas begins what Easter celebrates. And as followers of Christ, these are the anchor points of of what our faith is anchored to. And Christmas starts what we celebrate at Easter, that the baby in the manger becomes the Savior who hung on the cross and paid the price for our sins that we could never pay who offered us the greatest gifts we could ever know, the gift of salvation, which is the forgiveness, the debt being wiped away of our sins, of his presence, the ability to be able to have a relationship with our heavenly father, with the God of the universe, that we can have a relationship with him. Christmas isn't about the magic. This season is so special because it's about the miraculous. The miraculous that happened all of those years ago that our hearts are reminded, our spirits are reminded about every single year to come. And it's not about perfection either. It's not about the perfect decorations, the perfect house, the perfect meals, the the perfect parties being thrown, the perfect outfits being worn. It's not about all of those things. Yes, those different elements a lot of times make up this season, but it isn't about perfection It's about the personhood of Jesus as he came to earth, as he became a person, as he took on flesh to be with the people that he created. Christmas is about the personhood of Jesus. And in fact, when we go back to that very first Christmas represented here by this nativity, we see that really nothing about it was perfect. You know, we, we look at our nativity sets, and maybe some of you have nativity sets in your home, on, on a mantle, or on your entertainment center, or maybe in your yard, and, and we look at these nativity sets, and, and don't they just look so beautiful and peaceful, well put together, like everybody in the scene was just cooperating, right? Mary and Joseph, they just look so well put together. Baby Jesus just, you know, smiling, animals that are not pictured here, just on their best behaviors, right? Isn't that what we look at typically when we look at a nativity scene? And yet when we actually begin to read the accounts of what happened on this first Christmas, you know, we find that in the books of Matthew and Luke. Those are the two books of the Bible that narrate the birth of Jesus. So if you are looking to read, you know, not all four gospels talk about it, but Matthew and Luke's gospel tell us all of the different events that revolved around the birth of Jesus. And as you begin to read these accounts, you see that it was anything but peaceful, well put together with every part cooperating in order. The birth of Jesus was actually filled with unlikely moments, unlikely people, and unlikely circumstances. And when we use the word unlikely, we're often referring to the fact that we think that those people or those circumstances don't hold a very high chance for success, right? That's what we mean when we say unlikely. And that is true of this first Christmas, That the people, the element, the scenario, the circumstances surrounding how all of this came to happen did not hold much chance by the natural eye of what success would look like. That the way the Christmas story unfolded was not this great big rescue plan that God's people thought he was going to be setting into motion. It was actually an example of how expectation doesn't always line up with reality. And we know this, right? In our own lives, we've experienced the times where expectation and reality don't quite meet. And what do we find when that happens? We find a gap, don't we? We find a gap in the middle between our expectations and between reality. And that is what the Christmas story is literally filled with. 
You know, we can think about so many different areas in our life probably where expectation and reality didn't quite converge the way that we hoped they would. You know, I'm, I'm, we're, Arian and I are, are raising four boys, and, you know, I've had this expectation for years. I think I've got a, a picture to show it. I've had this expectation for years that, that sibling bonding was going to look like the top two pictures, you know, where they're just spending quality time together, sitting and just sharing their thoughts and, and sharing life. But the reality is that 99 point maybe 8% of the time, our boys have bonded through the years a little bit more like that bottom picture. And I had to adjust my expectation a little bit. Now, I know that that is a comical example, but we understand what this gap feels like, don't we? We understand what this gap looks like between expectation and reality, and often we find it in more serious areas of our lives, areas that feel heavier and harder to navigate through. The beauty of the Christmas story is that so many of these gaps existed, and in the midst of them, not, not in spite of them. In the midst of them, God showed up. It wasn't because it was perfect. It was because it was imperfect that God was able to show up on the scene. And he knew exactly how to walk his people through every single one of them. It's in all of these imperfections, all of these unlikely people and unlikely circumstances that the first Christmas gives us hope. In fact, for hundreds of years before Jesus was born, God's people tried to predict the Messiah's coming and what it would look like. There were prophecies about it given by God through Old Testament prophets like Isaiah, but people had their own ideas for how they wanted Jesus to be born, for how they wanted the Messiah to show up on the scene. And I just wonder if even that sounds familiar to us. Because don't we often get our own ideas of how we want God to answer our prayers? Don't we often get our own ideas when we're praying and when we're We get it in our mind how we want God to answer. And so we present that to God, waiting for him to answer that specific certain way. For hundreds of years, God's people were waiting for a savior, this mighty warrior king that was going to come and free them from the oppression that they had been under, from the Roman rule. They were waiting for rescue to come, for God to make things right, for God to smite their enemies and elevate the people of God. And God sent a baby. As they were waiting for a mighty warrior, God sent a baby. The Messiah came. Truthfully, the answer to every need that ever the people could ever had came. But it didn't come in the way that they were anticipating, the way that they hoped it would come. He did not come on the scene like the vision they had in their mind. It was a gap there was tension between expectation and reality. And this morning, I want to point out several of these gaps that we find as we read the first Christmas story. I want to even just look at Mary, for instance. We'll, we'll go to her first. And you take Mary, and you've got this, you know, Bible scholars say she was probably a, a, a teenage girl. That was typically the time that, that women started getting married in those days. And so you've got this teenage girl who is not married yet and who gets visited by an angel and told that God has chosen her to be the mother of the Messiah. That she is going to be carrying the Son of God in her womb. And again, she's not married yet. And so all of a sudden, she's going to turn up pregnant, which is going to cause people to start talking, and, and maybe some scandal begins to follow this story. But what we know about Mary is that she said yes with a heart full of faith and not a whole lot of information to go on or to have a guarantee by, not many assurances, but a willingness to follow God forward. In faith, we look at Joseph. expectations that did not meet a reality. Let's talk about the fact that, you know, this conversation actually had to happen. Where this fiance got, got a visit from Mary for her to tell him, I'm pregnant. I know it's not you, but I, I just want you to know it's, it's the son of God. 
this actually happened. This conversation actually happened. And I wonder, you know, men in the room, if that was you, how many of you would just angelically say, yes, yes, I, I believe that the Messiah is coming. This isn't just a story we read about, right? It becomes so common. This was a conversation that actually happened between two people engaged to be married. That she had to come and say, I am carrying the son of God in my womb. We don't know. We don't have a glimpse. I wish I could have seen his face when she said those words. I wish I could have seen her face. I wish I could have seen the pep talk she had to give herself to go have that conversation. We don't get that insight. But we do know that it took an angel coming to Joseph to tell him, to confirm to him that what she said was accurate because the Bible says he had already determined to walk away. He had already determined to say, okay, you can can just go on with your life and carry that son of God. An angel had to show up to him and say, listen, this is accurate. This actually happened You know, Mary and Joseph, being of Jewish descent, would have grown up hearing about the coming Messiah. But I bet they never expected that he was going to come as their baby. That they would be the ones to raise the Messiah that they would have spent their whole life waiting for, longing for, hoping for. And like we mentioned earlier, maybe not even expecting that he would come as a baby at all. I bet riding on a donkey at nine months pregnant for a very long journey was not quite what Mary expected that would be happening. Think about the fact that Jesus was born in a barn, right? The son of God, God himself being born in a barn after every other door was closed to them. I'm sure that's not quite what she anticipated when the angel had come to her nine months early to give this news. I wonder if she wondered if God still saw her if this was still accurate, if he was still leading and guiding their every steps? What about how the angels showed up to the shepherds in the field? You know, it's not really such a big thing now, I think, because we live in this era of social media, but I'm sure most of you can remember there was a time when birth announcements were huge, right? People would send out birth announcements, and this was Best picture of your baby, or you would pick the stationery, you would pick the card, you would go on and digitally pick what this was going to look like. You would put it together because you were so excited for the people that you cared about in your life many times who maybe didn't live in the same city, didn't live in the same state. You wanted them to know about your baby. And so you would put together this birth announcement. And you would send it out. And I never put one of those together, but I remember that same excitement of posting that up on social media and having cousins and siblings and people from all over that didn't live here in Arizona get to see pictures and and weigh in because you're sharing something so special with the people in your life that you care about. You know, God gave a birth announcement when his son was born. And he did it by lighting up the sky with a choir filled with angels to sing a song and to give this birth announcement that his son had been born. And do you know who he did it for? A bunch of shepherds in a field, sleeping under the stars that night. Unlikely, right? I'm sure when they started off on their journey, they didn't think that they were going to encounter the presence of God on that particular journey. Who were they? Shepherds. Ordinary. It was an ordinary average occupation. It wasn't something great and mighty. It wasn't something held and high. And yet that's who God chose to give his birth announcement to. And I've always wondered through the years, if it's because Jesus would go on to call himself the good shepherd, that is what he would choose to define himself to be. And instead of shepherding sheep, he would shepherd the hearts of his people who really are just as vulnerable. He would become the lamb that was slain, the sacrifice for our sins so that he could pay the price. He would have a lot in common with this group of common men. That night, those shepherds who themselves would have grown up hearing about the coming Messiah had no idea how or when he would come on the scene. 
but he was coming at that moment. The Christmas story is packed with these unexpected elements that make for unlikely outcomes. And yet, in the very midst of it all, Jesus made his entrance, which gives us the hope that in our unexpected situations, that when our expectations and our reality don't align and we find ourselves standing in the gap, that we have hope that Jesus can come into those moments in our lives as well. The way that we handle these gaps when we find ourselves standing between the two things, it really greatly impacts our lives. It impacts our mindsets. It impacts the way that we walk and and carry ourselves. You know, this is today, this Sunday, is the first day of Advent. And maybe some of you incorporate Advent into the traditions as you celebrate the Christmas season. Maybe some of you are just more familiar with the word, but not with the practice. But the word Advent, it means arrival. And it speaks to this waiting season. It speaks to the coming days and weeks. And, and it's, it, we take the month of December leading up to Christ's birth. And we remind ourselves of the waiting season that took place that actually had taken place for hundreds of years, but there was this waiting season, this great expectation, this anticipation that was building up as they waited for God's promises to be fulfilled. In Psalms 130, we we find encouragement, Psalms 130, verse five, that as we wait, that we can wait with hope. But we do wait There's nowhere in the Bible that gives us any guarantee that we won't have these gap seasons, that we won't find ourselves between expectation and reality probably more often than we don't. We find ourselves in waiting seasons, waiting for longings to be fulfilled, waiting for promises to be fulfilled, waiting for prayers to be answered, wondering when and how long. And in this season, these gaps. And so I want to share three biblical principles for handling these every time we find ourselves in a waiting season, in a gap between our expectation and our reality. And the first is this, we've got to stay prayerful. Have you ever heard the expression when someone says, I'm standing in the gap in prayer? Maybe somebody has said that to you before. I'm going to stand in the gap in prayer for you. What does that mean when people say that? It literally means that I see what your reality is. I know what you're expecting, what you're hoping for, what you're praying for. And I'm literally going to stand in this gap of the tension that exists between the two. And I'm going to pray with you. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to stand here like Arian alluded to community because sometimes this gap gets heavy. And sometimes this gap gets hard. And sometimes we get overwhelmed in this gap. And we get weary in this gap. And we get discouraged in this gap. And so when we say, I'm standing in the gap for you, it means I'm going to stand here in between the two. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray that God strengthens us while we wait. We're going to pray that God reveals to us what our expectation should be. We're going to pray that he refocuses our mind on him while we wait. We can also stand in the gap ourselves. And I would encourage you to take your expectations. If you know, we're, we're not always perfect at setting our expectations, Right? It's not always the right thing just because it's an expectation. It doesn't mean that God is going to fulfill that. But if we will invite him into that process, if we will ask him to help us set our expectations, to help us know what to do in these gaps, he will help us. He might encourage you and strengthen you to keep waiting, to keep standing fast, to keep seeking him during the process. He might lead you to change your expectation. He might lead you to pivot, to make a shift. But when we ask for his direction and wisdom, he gives it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God's will is for us to pray through all all circumstances, everything that we find ourselves in. 
to seek him in it, to seek him in the midst. It doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. I want to point that out. You're not giving thanks for the diagnosis. You're not giving thanks for the trauma. You're not giving thanks for that brokenness. It says give thanks in it, that in the midst of those things that are not good, you remind your heart that God is good. You remind your heart that you can lean in to the grace and the wisdom and the help that God offers, that in all things, we can pray through them. We can give thanks through them. Yes, it is hard and life is heavy. prayers, but we can pray in the midst of it. We can rejoice in the midst of it because what that speaks to our hearts is where our trust lies. That our trust doesn't lie in that answer. Our trust lies in the answer, in our Savior. We stay prayerful. Number two, we stay hopeful. The first theme that we focus on, there's four themes that you focus on during Advent, and the first is hope. It's hope because in the waiting, one of the first things that we find ourselves facing is discouragement, isn't it? It's so easy to get discouraged. And so the first truth and encouragement given is this word hope, that we don't lose hope while we wait. We don't lose hope while we stand in the gap and wait for God to answer, to lead us, to show us the next right step. Christmas is a reminder that there is still hope when we face dark seasons. You know, we have the played out, right? But they lived it one day at a time. They had to live it one day at a time, just like we have to live our lives We can go back through our Bibles and we can see that in those moments where it seemed dark and they didn't know what was going to happen, it's like you can look back and say, yeah, but hang on because, you know, just a few chapters later, you're going to get that victory. Can we give ourselves that same hope? That while we stand in the gap, we know that while God might not do it the same way, he is the same God. He is faithful. He is true to his word. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. It says, does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? No, he is true to his word. He is faithful and we can trust him in our seasons of waiting. Colossians 1.17 tells us that God existed before all things and he holds all things together. And that right there is our hope, that he holds all things together, that he takes the expectation and the reality. And in the gap, when we don't see it, when we don't know how it's all going to come together, we know that he is holding it all together. And even more encouraging, he's holding us together, that he surrounds us and holds us together when everything else feels like it's falling apart. When life is hard and messy and when things don't make sense, we have hope because of this truth that just like he came into a messy, chaotic world over 2,000 years ago, he steps into ours as well. He steps into those moments with us, those seasons with us. He walks out those days with us. This first Christmas was the start But every day after that has been a part of your story. It's been a part of my story as followers of Christ. We have a part of this and we can live our stories with hope because of this. Because of what was started. We never lose hope. And what I want to say about hope, it's not just wishful thinking. It's not just these, you know, vibes, these, this good energy when we, when we hope for something. When you're a follower of Christ and you choose to place your hope in him, what you're saying is I'm going to align my heart, I'm going to align my faith, I'm going to align my mind with the word of God. And that's a powerful thing. Hope is a powerful thing. And so when you find yourself in one of these gaps, stay hopeful. Cling on to it. Let it be an anchor for your soul. And lastly, stay hopeful open. I really believe that we struggle sometimes in our faith because we know that God can do anything. And so when he doesn't answer in the way that we want him to answer, when he doesn't show up on the scene the way that we anticipated him showing up, 
the way that we expected him to come in and rescue, when we don't see that, we can often close our hearts off. The enemy is so quick to come into those moments with disappointments, with lies to pull us away from God, to whisper lies to your mind where you start thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's not real. They hear me, maybe just whatever will be will be and prayer doesn't even matter. The enemy is so quick to come in on the heels of disappointment when you're in this season and we have to be on guard against it. We have to keep our hearts open to the things of God because while God can move in an creator of time. He's the God that set processes into motion, and he often uses the very timetables that he created to bring about the promises into our lives. And we see this over and over again in scripture, but we clearly see it in the first Christmas story. There was a need. There was a need for a savior. The world was hurting and broken and messy and filled with sin and pain, and there needed to be a solution. And that rescue would happen. But instead of placing a mighty warrior on the scene, God sent a baby who would then have to grow up, right? Who would then have to learn how to crawl and walk. Who would cry when he got hungry and tired? Again, we don't just flip through all the pages, through all the chapters in history. Jesus was born as a baby who would have to go through the process of time like every baby has to go through the process of time. He would go through all the seasons of childhood. He would go through the awkward seasons of puberty, voice cracks, and armpit hair. It's not sacrilegious. Jesus grew up as a person. And he faced all of these different stages in life. One of my favorite memories that I will always hold on to, one of my boys when he was in preschool and we were picking him up on a Sunday from church and it was around Easter time. And so they had done this, this Easter craft and I'm picking him up with his picture and we're in the car riding home and he asked just like only a little child could ask. He started talking about what they had talked about in the preschool class that day. And he said, Mom, it made me so sad to see Jesus hanging on the cross like that. And then he got kind of quiet. And he's like, but also I have a question. And he was like, did, did Jesus have a belly button? And I was like, wait, what? And I'm like, can I answer this? Am I allowed to have this conversation? He asked if Jesus had a belly button. And then he went on to tell me that the picture that they showed a belly button. And he had never at four years old had a thought in his mind that Jesus had a belly button. And what I loved about that conversation and what we were able to talk through afterwards and why I'm sharing it with you is because for the first time, this was becoming a real thing to him. It wasn't just a story in a book that we open around holidays and read for tradition's sake. This is our history. This is real. Jesus was real. He walked the earth. He is real. But he existed in physical form. He had to go from a baby through all the stages of childhood, become an adult before we see the promise fulfilled so yes, Christmas is a reminder that while God can move in a moment's time, he can be the God of the breakthrough, he can move instantly, he often uses seasons and processes to bring his will to fruition. He wasn't ushered on the scene doing miracles, he wasn't healing the blind as a teenager, not even as a young adult. It wasn't until he was 30 years old that Jesus began his public ministry, a ministry that would last for three years Talk about a timetable where expectation and reality probably didn't line up. God's timing is very rarely our timing, right? We have very different expectations when it comes to timing. But if we don't stay open to God's will above our own agendas, we can often miss him in this gap we can miss the lessons that he has for us to learn in this gap. We can miss the beauty of the miraculous in this gap. You might be in here today with a need, praying for something, and you know that God can do it, and he can, but he might not do it the way you're thinking. 
He might not do it the way that you're expecting or anticipating. And is your heart open to him showing up differently? Is your heart open to that promise being fulfilled in a way that you didn't expect, that you didn't anticipate? Whenever we find ourselves in this gap, if we'll stay open to God, he will lead us through it. And please hear me say this. He does lead us. Like Psalms 23 tells us, he is our good shepherd and he will lead us through it. He doesn't leave us in the midst of it. We are not left on our own in waiting seasons without help and without hope. He leads us in the midst of it. So if you find yourself today in process instead of at that destination, if you're looking around only to see the gap and that chasm might feel pretty large, Let your heart stay open to trusting God's timing, to trusting his will and his ways, knowing that they are higher than ours. Because can I remind you that if God were always to show up when we wanted him to and how we wanted him to, he wouldn't be God. We wouldn't have a need for God if if he just did everything that we already could think of on our own anyway. He comes because he has a different perspective. And so his timing is different from ours because he sees it differently. Don't close yourself off to other possibilities. Don't close yourself off to what God is doing. We can't predict how he's gonna move, but we can stay open. We can be open to his presence. We can be open to asking God, what is your will for my life in this season that I find myself in? It's maybe not what I thought it would look like, but it's not a surprise to you. So what is your will for me in this season? We can be open to him strengthening us while we wait. The truth is that while an entire world was going about its business, there was a baby in a stable that was about to change everything. Many of them wouldn't hear it though for another 30 years. The process had been set in motion. God was on the scene. And I want to tell you, I want to encourage your heart that God is on the scene in all of our lives as well. That when you don't see it, when you can't understand it, when it doesn't make sense, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul that he is moving. the pieces together. You know, the way I see it, Mary could have freaked out many times. And maybe she did a time or two, but what she is recorded for doing is trusting. In Luke 1, 47, as all of this is is sinking in for her, Mary says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Whatever we face, as we stand in our gap, can we determine in our heart that that's gonna be our statement as well? That my soul will proclaim the greatness of God. That no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I thought it would look like, no matter why I'm facing this right now at this season, my soul will proclaim the greatness of God. And can I tell you something about this? You look at this verse, you know, Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart your mind, your soul. We look at this statement that Mary makes, my soul will proclaim the greatness of God. Our soul is our mental and our emotional state. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, our spiritual state. When we proclaim, it's our mouth, it's our physical state. So our body, our mind, our soul, our spirit are standing on the promises of God to say, no matter what it looks like, my soul will proclaim the greatness of my Lord. My spirit will rejoice in God, my Savior. And if we can stand on that, if we can declare that in our hearts, if that can be the truth that we stand on, then no matter what season we find ourselves in, no matter what this gap looks like, no matter how long we are waiting or how many times we are are, are directed differently, we have hope. We aren't shaky because our foundation is sure that while everything else around us might be shaky, our God is unshakable. And so can we declare that in our lives like Mary did? She didn't know, she didn't know all the things, the joys, 
the pain, the incredible seasons. We all live these out. We stand on our foundation of who God is, the promise that we have in his word. Christmas confirms what Romans 8, 28 tells us, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, that in all things, that in this gap, with the, with the expectation over there and reality over there, in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. And we have the example of Christmas to confirm that in our heart, that all the years later when Paul wrote this, we see this truth woven all throughout scripture, in all things, in all things, whatever you're walking through right now, whatever you are facing right now, everybody who lifted their hand earlier and said, I'm going through a hard time. It is overwhelming for me right now. Life is heavy. It is hard. There are things that don't make sense. I am waiting. Let your heart be reminded that in all things, God is working and he is moving, whether you see it or feel it or not. And what is it for? It's for your good. It's for our good because God is good, even when our circumstances aren't. And we can trust that. You might not see how, but God is the savior. Saving is what he does. He is the redeemer. Redemption is what he does. It's who he is. Open your heart to what he would show you at this season. And let's not let this story become so common that we just don't even think about it anymore because the truths that we find here are things we need right now. In 2023, this Christmas, in our situations, the things that we carry, the seasons we find ourselves in, we need this reminder. We need this hope. We need this truth because this is our God. And this is our history. And I want to pray this morning. I know that Arian prayed for all of us that we would be reminded to stand in the gap strongly, surely, that we would look for others, that we would link arms as we stand in these gaps and that we would do it with a heart that is set on the Lord. So would you just close your eyes with me this morning? Would you just bow your heads? Lord, you know, God, the gaps that people are facing in here this morning. You know, Father, where expectation isn't meeting reality. And you know, God, that in our emotions, we can panic. Fear is quick to come in. Discouragement, disappointment. Father, you know that every You know what every single person is walking through. And Lord, all those who raised their hands earlier and maybe some who didn't, but they're navigating this gap. God, I pray that you would remind their hearts this morning and as they leave this week, that they would hold on to hope. I pray that you would stir up their faith, God, to be reminded that you are a God who keeps your promises. You don't always come in ways that we expect, God, but you fulfill your promises. And Lord, we stand on those more than we stand on our own agendas, more than we stand on our own desires, God, we stand on your word because it is in your word that we have put our hope. Stir our faith, God. Stir hope up within us that it would bubble over, that we would overflow with hope as we leave. Strengthen us, I pray. Strengthen our hearts. Strengthen our minds. And and Lord, I pray that when the enemy comes in, that you would remind us to proclaim that we will declare your goodness, that we will declare your greatness, that we will follow you forward, that we will trust you when things don't make sense, God, because you are good and you are working it out for our good. I wanna take a quick moment for those of you in here who maybe don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you've known about God, maybe you've sit in church so many times, but if you've never made the decision to become a follower of Christ, if you've never made the decision to to do that. Salvation is the gift he came to bring us. And it would be a missed opportunity to leave that gift unopened. And so if you say in your heart this morning, I want to know the Lord as my Savior, would you just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for? I want God to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to enter in 
to that gift of salvation. Thank you. You can put your hands down. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is who he says he is, then we are saved. And so I'm just going to ask that we all pray this together. Dear God, I want to know you. I need a savior. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price that I should have paid. Today, I receive your forgiveness. I choose to follow you forward as my Lord and Savior. Transform my life through your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. God, we thank you for the hope that you give. We thank you for the strength. We thank you for your love. We worship you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.